On Monday night, December 15th, 1997, Little Rock, Arkansas's Barton Coliseum hosted a night of action from the World Wrestling Federation. It was to be the WWF's final event of any kind before the roster and crew each went home for an 11-day Christmas break. It had been a long, eventful, and newsworthy year for the company of Vince McMahon, who had overseen a wholesale reconfiguration of the WWF as everybody knew it. Along the way, McMahon made some extreme decisions, not least of which was his double cross of champion Brett the Hitman Hart at the Survivor Series in Montreal. Only five weeks had passed since the screw job, so the smoke and dust from that ugly betrayal still lingered heavy in the air. I'm Jack from Coldaholic.com, and this is the story of the WWE House Show Riot. One beneficiary of Hart's fandom submission was the man who applied the hold, Shawn Michaels. The forcible title switch kicked off Michaels' third reign as WWF champion, while he continued to hone his unapologetic brashness as the leader of D-Generation X. Though Michaels was no stranger to playing a petulant heel, he was garnering more and more heat than ever, partially due to his participation in the screw job, but also for the way his antics continually pushed the envelope, especially at the advent of the Attitude Era. The Heartbreak Kid was a born heat seeker, and as 97 wound down, he wound up WWF fans through his explicit actions and his goading words. It wasn't uncommon for Michaels to trigger the fans' worst possible behavior, with one report in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter noting that Michaels would sometimes tell the crowd that he heard fans in that city had bad aim, practically inviting them to pelt he and his entourage with whatever projectiles were at hand. On the date in question, Michaels was scheduled to be a part of the main event in Little Rock, seconding Triple H for a match with Ken Shamrock, and Shamrock was to have legendary wrestler Danny Hodge in his corner. But before we get there, let's backtrack 24 hours and explain what happened the night before in Memphis, Tennessee. On that Sunday, the WWF drew a sliver over 5,000 fans to Memphis's Pyramid for a nine-match card that didn't prove to be all that satisfactory. Most of the matches lasted less than 10 minutes, including The Undertaker and The Rock battling in a casket match that was rather abbreviated due to Undertaker working through some nagging injuries. The main event, though, was truly an appeal to the locals, as Michaels and Helmsley set to face two men who were also sworn heels on WWF television, but were true heroes in that city, Jeff Jarrett and Jerry the King Lawler. On paper, that sounds like it would be quite a hidden gem, with DX playing outsider heels to Lawler and Jarrett's well-honed local babyface act. It wouldn't have made much sense in the 1997 WWF canon, but as an out-of-context novelty, it sounds like a fun match. It's just a shame that it didn't happen. A night of bad wrestling played a big part in the Memphis crowd shifting in their seats and becoming unruly, with a fair amount of alcohol helping fuel the irritation. Even before the main event, fan agitation was growing, and once DX made their appearance, the increasing hostility spilled over, causing the powder keg to blow. During the heel's entrance, Michaels was pelted by several beverages thrown by fans, which, given his level of heat, doesn't really seem too out of place. But when Helmsley was splattered in the face with a wad of tobacco juice, Michaels had seen enough. He grabbed the house mic and told the crowd of 5,000, that just cost you your main event. He then stormed off with Helmsley and China, leaving the squared circle in their wake. When the Memphis fans realized that Michael's walkout wasn't the staged posturing of the designated bad guy, their already foul mood quickly worsened. Dude Love made an appearance to try and smooth things over, telling fans that if they chanted for Sean, he might change his mind and wrestle. That didn't work. Then Lawler himself appeared to offer an apology to his local constituency, at which point some fans even threw trash at him. To compound this surge of animosity, the Wrestling Observer noted that fans were apparently not searched by security prior to admission into the building, and that quite a few attendees were able to sneak in their own drinks, as well as any other items that would usually have been disallowed. The WWF laid blame at the feet of the presiding security team for this reported lapse, as it certainly didn't help what turned into an ugly situation. The fact that refunds weren't offered only angered the attendees more. Through the overnight hours, local Memphis TV station WBII, which aired the WWF in syndication, received over 130 angry phone calls from fans who'd attended the house show. But what could they really do about it? What was done was done. In the end, all things considered, nothing too terrible happened. No reports of injuries or anything like that, just a poor wrestling event that one of the headliners walked out of due to fan behavior, leading then to a bit more bad fan behavior, but it pretty much ended there and the WWF was probably just glad to put it behind them. Little did they know what awaited them in just a day's time. After Sunday night's fiasco, the WWF troupe made the two-hour drive from Memphis to Little Rock ahead of their final event before the holiday break. 
Fans entering the Barton Coliseum that Monday night were expecting a killer episode of Raw is War. The problem was, even though it was a Monday, those fans in Little Rock were not attending a Raw taping at all. Allow us a little quick digression to explain the WWF's TV schedule of the day. Prior to the summer of 99, Raw was only live every other week. They would run a live Raw episode on a Monday night and then tape the following week's episode the next day on a Tuesday. Raw had aired live from Portland, Maine on Monday the 8th, so the episode scheduled to air on Monday the 15th was actually taped on Tuesday the 9th in Durham, New Hampshire. Any other events that took place in those two weeks between the Raw tapings were just house shows, and that's exactly what fans in Little Rock were getting, a regular house show with likely no storyline development, no pyrotechnics, no Titantron, and no TV cameras. This was in spite of the fact that on a regional level, the WWF reportedly advertised the show as a Raw taping, promoting it as such on billboards and on local radio. Now apparently, many of the fans attending that night didn't know until they'd arrived that it wasn't a Raw taping, and that's where the trouble started. Apparently quite a few had brought signs thinking they were going to be on TV, only to learn that that wasn't going to happen. To add to the sour feelings, the Little Rock card was just like the one in Memphis, in that the match quality was considered substandard. There were also quite a few changes to the advertised card. Shamrock was apparently substituting for an injured dude love for one, and that only piled onto the overall sense of anger and confusion. Reports have indicated that most of the five matches that took place didn't even go three minutes. Among them was another casket match between Undertaker and Rock, which again only went a few minutes, again deferring to Undertaker's injuries. From the early going, some of the 6,500 fans in attendance began throwing trash, including bottles, and apparently even spat at the wrestlers. The patrons were warned that if they didn't cease with the unruly behavior, the main event would be canceled. With hardly a day passed since DX refused to work the Memphis card due to similar fan actions, this was hardly an idle threat. We've mentioned earlier that amateur and professional wrestling legend Danny Hodge was in attendance that night in Little Rock, where he was going to be Ken Shamrock's corner for the evening's main event. In addition to being ringside for that match, Hodge was given an award during an in-ring ceremony, and it sounds like a genuinely nice segment, especially for an all-time great like Mr. Hodge. So it's a shame that the Little Rock fans mercilessly booed the ceremony. Michaels himself played a key role in the moment, and most figured that his presence in the ring was the actual source of the crowd's annoyance. But for fans to look past a moment of recognition for Danny Hodge like that really speaks to where the mind of the mob was at this point in the night. By the time the main event slot came, there was no winning anyone back. No possible way to save the show. It was simply time to trudge forth with the Helmsley vs Shamrock match that was on tap. Get in, get out, and everybody goes home for the holidays. When Michaels and Helmsley made their entrance, Sean was once again the subject of target practice, and apparently it didn't take much to draw his ire. Reports indicate that Michaels was hit with some sort of paper object, but that was all it took. After the previous night's events, the WWF champion seemed to have no interest in seeing what was next in the crowd's arsenal. Once more, the furious Michaels took to the mic, told the crowd that they weren't getting a main event, and DX hastily departed from ringside. After the heels exit, the crowd apparently waited to see if DX was just doing some heel shtick, pretending to leave but coming back out after a moment or two. Apparently, nobody had smartened Little Rock up to what had happened in Memphis the previous night because when the ring announcer informed the crowd that the main event was cancelled and the show was over, the fans reacted with outrage. And that's when all hell broke loose. Only 20 or so security guards had to match up with many angry fans, who immediately began throwing chairs, glass beer bottles, and other hazardous projectiles. More alarming than that even are the stories that somehow fire apparently came into play. Some reports, including fan accounts of the night from both Pro Wrestling Stories and Sports Kida, claim that some fans ripped the shirt off one of the security guards and set it on fire right there in the venue. Another report claims that somebody even launched a roll of flaming toilet paper from one of the upper decks. The overwhelmed security force had no chance at quelling the riot, so city and state police were called in to take it from there. Tear gas was dispensed throughout the Coliseum, which was enough to mostly defuse the situation, but only for a moment. While the tear gas aided to clear the building, still outraged fans in the parking lot attempted to get refunds, only to have their requests refused. This led to another ugly scene outside the building, which police also had to intervene in. There was also a report that rowdy fans outside the venue pounded on a car that contained wrestlers Too Cold Scorpio and Charles the Godfather Wright. The two were said to have exited the vehicle Vehicle, but fortunately, no physical altercations ensued. And as for Michaels, he and DX apparently needed a police escort to get out of the parking lot. Numbers vary depending on the report, but the consensus is that multiple arrests were made, the Wrestling Observer claims 13, and also a number of individuals were sent to the hospital with minor injuries. The incident was reported that night on local news broadcasts, really putting to the test the theory that all publicity is good publicity for a WWF still struggling to find its footing in a competitive wrestling war. 
So many combustible elements came together to create the hostile atmosphere. Questionable advertising for one, a poorly delivered product, a heat magnet main event star, and probably a few too many beverages snowballing into a genuine horror show. This isn't to absolve anybody that aided the destruction, however. I mean, an underwhelming Headbangers versus Godwins match is no excuse to start a bonfire with someone's clothing. More than two years passed until WWE ran Little Rock again, returning for a house show less than a week before 2000's No Way Out pay-per-view. Close to 16,000 fans witnessed what almost had to be a better card, featuring Kurt Angle vs Chris Jericho, Kane vs X-Pac, and an Arkansas street fight pitting The Rock against the big boss man. And this time around, there were no incidents of note reported. Bad fan behaviour hasn't been completely eradicated in the two decades since, as seen with idiots jumping the rail or throwing trash, or even the occasional confrontation like when Jericho had to deal with a group of fans after a 2009 house show in Canada. And we can't forget the angry fans that tried to block the wrestler's exit at the 2015 15 Royal Rumble, with some coming a little bit too close to a beating at the hands of the Usos. But WWE has dealt with nothing as positively crazy as the events of December 15th, 1997, and since that night, nor hopefully will they, or any other wrestling organization, ever again.